How's it going, guys? FTO Nerd Talk here. This is D. Shaw the Silicon with us today. Hopefully, we get an episode going here pretty soon. But today, we're going to talk about Oneshi Comics with uh, JL and Lindsay, two of the co founders of the company. Are you guys the only co founders? And welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Lindsay, and this is JL. You Hello. can't see him, but he's beside me. I'm um, here. We, we are the two co founders of Oneshi Press. Yeah. It's only you two guys. You guys have a, a huge staff. Like you guys like just, how did that, how did that happen? How like how did the creation of this company go? Well, I don't know. There's like a long version and a short version. <laughs> well, so let's start with the short version. Um, and if you want us to elaborate on anything, we can, you know, it's, uh, I, I've always been into visual storytelling and Lindsay has always been into writing. And so when we met, you know, Lindsay had uh, Tracy Queen written and needed an illustrator. And I was illustrating pack and had the concept down, but I really needed a writer. So we just paired up on those two projects. I was like, hey, if I illustrate yours, will you write mine? You know, um, and you're, you're writing and, Children of Gaia currently, right? So, yeah, Children of Gaia, I've been working on with another partner, uh, Chris Cavelli, for since like the, I don't know, mid 90s. And we now have, and Lindsay also is a writer on that now. Um, and we've been joined by quite a few other people. We have a, a group working on Children of Gaia. It's a big, big project. Um, it's a, like a series, you know, and it's, it's told across multiple media we have comic books and and novels and we're planning a tabletop role-playing game um, but yeah Lindsay and i were working on pack and tracy queen and you know we tried to shop it around we like made eight page samples of both and tried to shop it around to like you know starting from the big two and then getting smaller and smaller and indie and you know we got a lot of positive feedback which from what i hear is good like a lot of people don't even get feedback if they're unheard of and they're sending to like big publishers right. we got positive feedback but most of it was like well this is great but it doesn't fit what we're doing and so what we started realizing was a lot of these companies have specific like ideas about their branding and their own extended universes and their own look and feel and they really want things that fit in with what they're doing and what we wanted to do is create something different so other people were like, we like it, but it's not us, you know. Um, and we started to realize a lot of our ideas and our stories are, are really cool and get a lot of great feedback from people, but they're different. You know, they're, they're just kind of, they don't exactly fit other people's holes, you know, like the square peg in a round hole thing. Right. So, you know, that's where we were like, well, let's, let's self-publish. And at the time, you know, I was working... Um, at Continuity Studios under Neil Adams, and he was publishing a lot of his own stuff. And Lindsay was working at um, Penguin, which had merged with Random House. And they didn't go with the name Random Penguin House, but they should have. Instead of his, what, Penguin? They're, they're now, how are you coming with stuff? <laughs> Hang on. Now it's Penguin Random House. Right, Not it should have been Random Penguin, Penguin House, because that's yeah. funnier. I agitated but, for that, but nobody was. Anyway, so, you know, that, that's like, those are like the two big publishers in, uh, in prose like novels and nonfiction and right so like i mean penguin and random house they're pretty much like the two yeah, biggest the publishers, two biggest publishers. Well, so, the, the one biggest publisher and, of books. you know as an editor for them Lindsay had a lot of inside scoop on how that worked um so we just kind of had all the ingredients we had a project that we wanted to self-publish and we were like you know what wait 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 if we're going to self-publish this and we have all this like background and all this knowledge like we have to assume that there's a lot of other people out there that are having problems getting their stuff in where it doesn't fit and like you know maybe we should just you know open this up and make it our own you know indie and small publishing company that we can help other people who like need their you know need to get their foot in the door in the industry and need to get their work out there and need to you know so like we kind of were like all right let's do the thing we'll create the platform that we need for ourselves but also that other people need you know we, we're creating the platform that we wish someone else had created for us you know gotcha. and we're sharing that um what when it comes to uh the 
the titles that you guys do have? Are they only digital copies or are they also physical? No, we, we do physical copies, um, which is sort of a liability as a very small publisher because printing is expensive and difficult. Um, but from day one, we knew that we wanted, we wanted stuff in print. Um, I think partly that's just because like I'm old school. We have, we have a shelf of books in our living room that is like literally an entire wall. <laughs> we like print media. Um, but also like uh, we were kind of looking around at the landscape of print and digital media a few years ago. And we thought like digital media is great. A lot of people love it. Um, but there's just, there's something so nice about having like a really beautiful printed volume in your hand. And you know, we're, we are growing all the time. We're still not really at a point where we can print huge numbers of books, but right. we do work very hard to make the books that we publish beautiful. We publish like really, we do high quality printing on high quality paper. Um, and most people, when they actually get one of our books in their hand, like they always say, wow, this is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and to us, that's like, that's exactly what we want to hear. Um, but we do also print or publish rather digitally. Um, we have digital comics on our website and on Comixology Spin and Spinwiz and Drive Through uh, Comics drive -through. and when, Amazon. I think. When it comes to uh, to COVID season being never like the way it is and everything, uh, I'm not sure if you guys have any in comic book shops. That's like part of my second part question. But like, how does that work out for you guys? Like trying to get these these copies out and try to get them inside of stores at the same time. Like, is that possible for you guys right now? So we, we haven't been doing the store thing anyway because the distribution um, to get things into stores generally through, you know, through the big distributor is like, Diamond, you just have to primarily. go real cheap and in real high numbers, um, real high numbers. And, you know, we've been doing like small batch top shelf kind of stuff. So we haven't really fit with the... Um, the mainstream distribution to comic book shops model. Yeah. We're like not, the, not, the even, model. not even local shops, like in your area? I mean, yeah, we have some stuff in local shops, but I mean, so we haven't been doing the shop thing because of, you know, uh, 2020, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we've still been doing our Kickstarters and, and we still have our online shop. And, you know, we have books that have been in boxes for like months you know, and we, <laughs> Lindsay and I, because, uh, you know, we've been seriously hardcore quarantined since the, like the very beginning of COVID, you know, and, um, Makes sense. you know, we have all of our stuff. We, we package and fulfill ourselves. We do it very cleanly. We have masks, <laughs> we have gloves, we have sanitizer, <laughs> you know, like Sanitize our books are quarantined, <laughs> we're quarantined. And then we send them through USPS, which, you know, hopefully when people get something in the mail, they, wipe it off first, maybe let it sit for a little while when it's cooled down, then, you know, like we always encourage, you know, being clean. But. The, the biggest impact I think that COVID has had on us is actually the convention circuit. Mm. Um, because we print in such small numbers and because we print high quality, we really can't match the pricing of what most people expect when they walk into a comic book store. Like that's not a viable option for us to you know, do super low pricing. So how much um, is a copy? Well, it depends on the book. Um, okay. But I think our 120 page anthologies are 20 bucks. Wow. Yeah. And you guys have over 13 titles inside that, right? Yeah, we've yeah. got uh, two issues each of our standalone comic series, uh, Tracy Queen and Pack. And then we are currently kickstarting our 10th comics anthology. And Mr. Guy, which is going to be our third standalone comic series. <laughs> and what Tracy Queen is ten dollars an issue, and Pack is seven fifty an issue. I think Tracy Queen is fifteen an issue because they're nice, big, perfect bound books. Let's uh, uh, let's talk about Tracy Queen. All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's definitely like a, a not suitable for work type comic. Uh, is <laughs> is that like uh, like the theme of most of your comic books? And like, how did this comic book get presented to you guys, and you guys just decided to run with it? Well, no, it's not. Okay, well, let me backpedal a little bit. Um, so Tracy Queen is a sex positive graphic novel. Um, and that can mean a whole lot of different things depending on the person that you're talking to. Um, but for me, uh, I, I wrote Tracy Queen back in like 2012-ish. Right, <laughs> um, 
and for me what that means is you know it's a book where sex is part of the focus um but rather than it being the exclusive focus where like you know this is this is a book that you get if you're randy and you want to do something about it that's not what tracy queen is tracy queen is a story where sex is an integral part of the story right and where, it's a character yeah where sexuality is like it's not a bad thing. It's not a shameful thing. It's not even really a titillating, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is about sex. Like, it's just like, yeah, this is an important part of the story. Um, so I actually have a background in writing journalism and criticism and reviews and whatnot about pornography, um, which is a whole other story unto itself. Um, but basically I stumbled into a, an adult DVD reviewing gig when I was in my mid twenties and I needed a job. Um, so I started reviewing these quote unquote adult DVDs. How and long I did was that like, for? this is weird and interesting. And I don't know how to be okay with it. Like, cause I was watching some weird stuff. You know? Oh, you had to watch them before you. Yeah. Them. I, I was watching like, and that was in, uh, I think I started it in like, 2007, 2008, which was like sort of the the last dying gasps of the DVD porn era. So I was getting like double disc DVD sets that were like five, six hours long, and I was supposed to review these things. You, you got you got to give me like like a how how would you review a pornographic <laughs> film? Like what would you say in a pornographic film? You know, you just had to get creative. <laughs> um, the, the magazine that I wrote for specifically was like, be funny, make stupid okay. jokes. Alliteration is fine. So um, I tried to make my reviews like funny, you know, like little wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, but I also like, I, you know, being like a woman and considering myself a feminist at that time and watching some of this like really hardcore stuff, I was like, always struggling to be like how do I feel about this is this okay like are these people okay what's going on here um so after I'd been doing that for a little while I started writing sort of about my experience of like like asking all the questions that came to me as I was watching these movies um and over time that kind of morphed into me actually like going to porn conventions and interviewing like porn stars and asking them the questions wow. that had occurred to me and like learning I learned so much about the adult entertainment industry and since then um like I've I've written a book about my experiences and then I wrote Tracy Queen which is kind of also about my experiences but through the lens of like this weird sci-fi talking animal sidekick romp um that gets to ask all of the big questions, but also be fun and funny and over the top and ridiculous. Um, so that was like, when I started thinking about the character of Tracy Queen, um, I just automatically knew that it had to be a graphic novel. And that's really where my whole foray into becoming a comics publisher started. And then as JL said, we shopped it around to a bunch of places and people were just like, this is nice, but we have no idea what to do with it. So after hearing what you just said, like, I think, I think graphic novel could be the only way you can go with something like that. It couldn't be like a, yeah. a weekly, a weekly coming. You have to put like your full story into like one full book. And yeah. it's, uh, I read a few of the pages. It's, uh, it's, it's raunchy, like you said, but uh, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not, over the top and like the the other one of the characters is a raccoon so like you you know <laughs> right off the bat not to take it too serious <laughs> exactly right. exactly and i kind of like i kind of hid some of the serious stuff that i really want to talk about inside of it because like i mean there's a talking raccoon there's yeah. cyborg clones like psh, this is clearly <laughs> ridiculous but actually <laughs> i want you to think about this stuff and like that that was one of the things that that, that drew my attention when uh, she kept asking the, the raccoon character yeah. uh how he feels about homosexuality and he kept repeating that he's a raccoon like uh he doesn't care about any of that because he's he's a raccoon like and it, it kind of showed a spotlight more towards herself if anything else and like that that, that was a, a cute nod that i noticed <laughs> but it was, it was very interesting 
Thank you. I really like that moment, actually. Uh, that character, Nicola, gets away with a whole lot because he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm yeah, right. he's like an innocent bystander in like the, the yep. world that we live in. <laughs> when, when it comes to uh, Mr. Guy, Zombie Hunter, what, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is all you, JL. Uh, what, 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 what prompt this comic for you? Well, all right. So Mr. Guy's Zombie Hunter really is a nod to, like, to personally, my, my childhood kind of, like, modular thoughts about, about really playing with toys, right? Like, I mean, this, I always go back to, like, for me, storytelling is, comes down to, like, dumping out the toy box with all these different toys from different worlds and universes and series and being like you know what i'm gonna make my own story where they all exist in one you know in one story that's how i played as a kid i would take my gi joes and my ninja turtles and my whatever you know like transformers and they all existed in the same world so i've always done that with storytelling i love it uh i think it's kind of like a, a jazz pop culture mythos you know um and with Mr. Guy particularly, I also always had a love for zombies and horror and all things, you know, creepy. And, you know, I was always watching those like, like Hellraiser and Dawn of the Dead and Night of the Living Dead. And, you know, those are my childhood favorites. So, um, but I also loved like things with goblins in them, you know, like fantasy and Lord of the Rings and, you know, like, especially those goblins from legend i know a lot of right. people really didn't love the movie legend but like those goblins <laughs> were so freaking awesome they, they had they had their part inside of it like if they weren't inside of it the movie wouldn't be the way that it is i, I get oh, what man. you mean yeah yeah that, <laughs> it wouldn't be the same to a lot of goblins it was great i i think we have found a kindred spirit <laughs> 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 somebody we can just throw down on legend like yeah Let's be friends. <laughs> I, I, it's a very good movie. Like, uh, it's pretty much uh, the, the the last unicorn. But, you know, in yeah, the movie version. Yeah. yeah. I like, actually had a VHS with both of those movies bootlegged on it. Nice. And how could you not have them, like, on the same disc? Because they're they're amazing. Yeah. They're, they're also, the same film, but yeah. So it also had, it was Legend, <laughs> Last Unicorn, Dark Crystal, and Labyrinth. <laughs> wow. All on one eight-hour VHS. Oh oh, it wow. was like the vhs that's a whole weekend right i there. watched that pretty much every weekend all you needed to uh, fill that void was willow on top of it yeah oh you know what i actually actually had a uh, a version of willow that was like not bootleg and i think it was <laughs> like blockbuster they would get like a whole bunch when it was when something was a new release you know and then as it was no longer a new release they would sell the used copies and only keep like one on the show like shelf. a five dollar bin yeah. yeah, so like gotcha. I got Willow from my, like that five dollars bin. <laughs> Man, I watched the heck out of that too. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I do know like there's some similarities between uh, uh, Lindsay's comic and your comic that um, that Mister Guy also has a companion along with him <laughs> on his adventures. Uh, was it is it Spooky? Is his name Spooky? Yeah, yeah. Is is, is Spooky binary or is Spooky? Uh, does, does Spooky have the gender attached to him? Um, I think Spooky's gender is sassy intellectual. <laughs> so he's he's just a floating brain, pretty much. Uh, Basically, yeah. Gotcha. Like that's yeah. Spooky's he's, pronouns are smarty pants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, to, I think he uh, goes back. So, yeah, I mean, I guess basically my point was just like, I love the goblins, I love the zombies, I love the fantasy, I love the horror. And I was like, you know what, let me just have horror in a fantasy world and see where that goes, you know. And that opened the door for a lot of different influences to become part of it. And all your different arcs have different artists attached to them. Uh, oh. JC, JC Chase for our volume four, uh, Diana Camaro for arc three. Walter, was it Osley for Art yeah, Two? Walter Osley. And you did the first. Yes. Why? Why all the different changes for different arts? Like, was that intentional, or did was that just happenstance because you couldn't get the same artist, or you didn't want to do all of them yourself? Oh no, it's definitely part of the plan. Okay. So, um, going back to what I was saying about like that, that jazz mythos in pop culture is like each chapter is written to kind of dissect lampoon or, or otherwise you know like spoof riff on 
a different like pop culture take on the zombie apocalypse. So the whole idea here is Mr. Guy, this half goblin in the zombie apocalypse is trying to cure himself to free himself from the zombie curse that is, you know, growing and infecting him. And to do that, he needs to figure out what's causing the zombie apocalypse. So he goes through all of these different scenarios. Like we kind of like go through like the resident evil scenario, like, Oh, maybe it was created in a lab and maybe we can find the cure for it that way. Or like, you know, in, in one of the future arcs, he even literally goes to heck and like, tries to see if, you know, Big D has anything to do with it. Um, oh, and, and, are these like the actual names of the story, Heck and Big D? Yeah, yeah. I, I thought it would be funny to not you actually. You wanted to be a little tongue-in-cheek on You know, that. like just to be a little cheeky about it. Gotcha. Just lie. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, he's like constantly going through these different arcs to try to figure out what the zombie apocalypse is and how to stop it so that he can save himself. Um, and so each one has a very different vibe and is referencing different things in pop culture. And so for me, pairing that with an artist whose work is appropriate for that chapter kind of felt like, um, you know, I think I've used the metaphor before of like, you know, pairing a, a fine wine with like an aged cheese or something, you know, like stuff it's- Stuff we know so much so about. Stuff that's uh, very <laughs> fancy. This is my version of that because I don't know anything about wine or cheese. I really wish I did, but I do know about storytelling, right? Um, so this is my version of that. You know, it's like the, the curation aspect is really important. And actually there's 12 arcs total. I'm doing the first one and the last one and oh, wow. the 10 arcs in between will all be different artists. So uh, you two also have a couple like one more comic that you guys did together. And that's, uh, that's what I really want to talk about. It's pack yeah. pack 3.3. 3. Uh, this involves a, a cop in, or I guess crime in a city with uh, a lot of, a lot of undertones on top of it. What, uh, what, what prompted this story in particular? Was there any reason for it or just like something that popped in you guys at that? Well, well, I could tell actually the backstory. Well, well, first of all, we should just make it clear for anyone listening that PAC 3.3 is the most, um, up, the most recent um, eight Release. pages. Yeah, that'll be in the next anthology. Right, of uh, an ongoing series. So we've got two issues out of, or we've got two full issues out so far and Pack one and two the eight pages in this upcoming anthology are the last eight pages of the third issue so you're seeing like the very end of that part of the story gotcha right so it's like each one is in three parts so there's pack one pack 1.2 1.3 and then there's pack 2.1 2.2 2.3 <laughs> So we've just been releasing them in eight page arcs in our anthologies, but then we're bundling them as actual issues. So you can get pack one and pack two and soon you'll be able to get pack three. Um, so pack is, it's about a vigilante who lives with a pack of dogs. So there's six dogs and this one guy patients. Um, and there are police officers in it. Um, one of the, one of his kind of like allies is a police officer who's trying to figure out his like role in all this because there's a lot of corruption, a lot of gentrification. Things start getting heated between, you know, people in the community and the police. And he wants to be a good guy. He believes in like the good apple kind of thing. And one of the bad guys is a cop and definitely like embodies the bad apple right I'm assuming the, the good guy is james mchaggart and the antagonist mm -hmm. is vincent yes yeah, yeah. gotcha I mean, and and cool. james's partner um carla is also both james and, and carla i think um are they're really you know their heart is in the right place they're they're, trying, they're trying, trying trying to do the right thing and trying to figure out what that is so really like the the dichotomy is between vincent this bad law enforce, enforcement officer and then patience who's this outlaw criminal vigilante whose his alignment is good you know so it's like chaotic good versus like lawful evil you know um and 
James and Carla are kind of in the middle, They're like neutral. trying to figure it out, like where they stand and how they feel and what, what is good and what is right and what this all means, you know? Um, yeah. And the pack 3.3 that's going to be in the upcoming anthology is where we really start to see like who's on what side up until that point, it's been a little bit tough to figure out like who's who we're as readers wanting to align ourselves with and the pages that you just read are where like it really starts to become clear that like Vincent is not an okay person but he's you know part of this organization that James and Carla who we like are also a part of and what where does that leave us you know as readers and writers and obviously we are moving forward with the story after that but no spoilers <laughs> yeah I can no spoilers, but given what's happening right now, like was that was that an intentional thing to make it like uh, <clears throat> make it like not having a side that you wanted like to, to root for, or was that just uh, just happened until like you got the third the third volume out? Well, so it was always like it was always our idea. Like, we know where the story's going. We know where James ends up. We know where Carla ends up. We know because even the dogs the choices they ultimately this, right? make. I'm sorry. Even the dogs are characters inside this story, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Dog. The dogs. Each actually, each issue focuses on a different dog and that dog's backstory, and introduces us to who that dog is and why they're a member of the pack. Gotcha. So there's seven issues altogether. The seventh one is about Patience, who is the human dog. Um, He's, he's, he's like the, the vigilante, the stray man. <laughs> um, so like we know where James and Carla's story is going. And honestly, we wanted to take a little bit longer to get there. We wanted to take a little bit longer for them to start to see that, you know, their allegiances might not be what they thought they were. Um, but in light of everything that's been going on, we kind of wanted to just sharpen the the focus a little bit and have a little bit more of a hint of where it's going in pack 3.3 yeah um you know we just in reading the room we were like we need to make it clear that that we're not not seeing what's going on in the world um we wanted to take a little bit more time to get there but, but i think it's important time. yeah yeah and that it's we... better that there wasn't more time um gotcha but yeah it, we definitely <laughs> we had it like written and we were working on the art um and basically over the past you know two months we had to like sit down and be like all right we need to make it clear where we stand as creators and that we are not on the side of this bad guy in the book or the things that he represents or uh any of that so um we couldn't we couldn't totally go back in and like rework the whole story in the time that we had, but we did try to make what adjustments we could. Um, Just added little bits of foreshadowing to the dialogue yeah. and stuff okay. like that. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna really pick up in the next issue. Uh, you guys have a huge team, like a really big team. Uh, I think Chris Covelli, uh, Peter Lampanosa. Yeah. Uh, Carl Ray. Ludwig, is it is it flat squat? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Olimba, like a, and all these folks, you got like an even bigger cast than that. I'm only I'm only on your website right now, looking at what I can see in front of me. Uh, how did all these folks come to your team? Well, some of them we sought out. Some of them were people we've known. Chris, I grew up with. He's been my best friend since we were 12 and that was a longer time ago than you may think <laughs> um so like a lot of it is people finding out about our anthologies because they don't know how to get their work out into the world and where it fits and they google it and they find Oneshi press and it turns out we're like one of the you know we're giving people a, a way that they can get their work in print in our anthologies and get copies that, you know, they can get at wholesale and sell full price. Um, in addition to, you know, the, the copies that we give them just as contributors. And then also like it, they get to keep the rights to their stories. It's creator owned, you know, so all these people are really just using the anthology as a way to like 
have their work out in the world and share it with other people's audiences. It's a co-op model, you know, so, gotcha. and, you know, later on, if they want to publish elsewhere, they can, because it's, they're keeping the rights to it. Uh, and that's really important to us that we're doing this to help people, not to take from people and not to, you know, we're not collecting IPs or anything like that. Um, we have our own IPs that we're very proud of. We own them, we created them, you know, like th those are our things, but we also know that other people have their babies and we want to help them get their baby out without, you know. <laughs> when it comes to your IPs, are they in a, in a shared universe? So Pack and Tracy Queen are in a shared universe and we've toyed around with a few other IPs that exist in that, that could exist in that universe in that world um like there's even times where in pack you might see something from tracy queen in the background and vice versa um mr guy is a fiction in that in that world and you, then there's you can read mr guy comics in the tracy queen and right. world. okay right. oh like actually, okay so it's like <laughs> it's, it's a character but like only a fictional character inside that world right like nicola Lee reads mr guy comics Gotcha. Um, and then Mr. Guy actually has his favorite comic book character, Kung Fu Catfish, that he reads. So there's like layers of fiction here. You know? A lot of nods to like all the different comic books that you guys have a part of your, oh, yeah. part of your company. <laughs> all right. Uh, this has been fun. This has been a great talk with both of you guys. Uh, where can we find your comic? And I think you guys have a Kickstarter out right now, right? Oh, yeah. So um, any of our any of our comics that have already been published, you can find on our website, oneshipress.com. That's O-N-E-S-H-I-P-R-E-S-S.com. Um, and our current Kickstarter is for Mr. Guy Zombie Hunter Act 1. That's arcs 1 through 4, like we just talked about. Um, and the 10th anthology, which is the Origins anthology. It has 13 different eight-page comics in it from creators from diverse backgrounds um, from all around the world. So that's a really big deal. These two awesome collections. Again, Mr. Guy is uh, done by four different artists. And then- Any names you um, wanna drop? Oh yeah, yeah. So there's, I again, I did the first one. And then Walter Osley, um, who's just amazing. He did, um, he, let's see, he drew Isnana, which I'm reading now. He did um, Metal, Shark, Metal Bro. Shark Bro 1 and 2. He did uh, Shiver Bureau, Cubicles, Hacksaw. I mean, he's, he's really well known, um, especially on Webtoons. It's really like blowing up on Webtoons. Um, and he's an amazing artist and a great friend, great person. And then um, Act 2, or Arc 2 rather, is done by Diana Camaro, who we've worked with in the past. Uh, she did Guts, which is a short story Lindsay wrote. And she's just fantastic. She's a powerhouse she illustrator. Up and coming. <laughs> We're going to be hearing that name a lot more. Yeah, uh, yeah she's really, really cool. And then JC Chase, uh, we've worked with them quite a few times, and we will continue to work with them. They are a content creator, illustrator, um, avid YouTuber. I mean, just a community leader, a great person. Really, really cool. And uh, we're super stoked about that lineup. And, and then the anthology has, again, like... It's like two dozen people have worked on yeah, the anthology. Two dozen, <laughs> two dozen creators so. on the anthology. And both of them are in the same campaign. You can get them together by backing the Mr. Guy and the Origins Anthology on Kickstarter. Yeah. And if you go to any of our websites right now, oneshipress.com or mrguycomic.com, uh, jldraco.com, lindsayg.com, <laughs> any so of them. Many dot coms. <laughs> I would say check out mrguycomic.com, but right up at the top, you'll see the video to the Kickstarter and a link to the Kickstarter. Yeah, you can't possibly miss it on anything that has anything to do with Oneshi Press right now. <laughs> right on. Uh, there's one last thing I wanted to ask before we before I let you guys go. Uh, the logo that you guys have, like where did yeah. the logo come from? So the logo is actually, um, it's the crest of Mythera, which is one of the great nations of Renderaya in the Children of Gaia universe. Yep, we made so, it. So yeah, it's our, <laughs> it's our made up crest. Um, right it's an ancient like elven great nation, which has been destroyed 
um, and taken over by, you know, the, all, a lot of, all of these great nations have been destroyed by an empire, um, the Terran Empire. And so there is a rebellion happening and that crest becomes a very, a very important crest to uh, quite a few of the factions in the rebellion. And, and so, yeah, there you have it. That's yeah. both where the word Oneshi comes from. The Oneshi are people that are chosen to lead the Mytherans. And the crest of Mythera is is the Mytheran crest. There. I dig That's it. That's our logo. All right, Lindsay, JL, like thank you both for being on the show. This has been great. I've been, I learned a lot about your company. company. Uh, <laughs> check them out. They're all over the place. They're on Twitter. You guys do have an Instagram too, right? I haven't looked into your Instagram yep. or not. Yeah. Yeah, we're on Issue Press everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, just everywhere. look for us. You'll probably find us. I know that you guys have a Patreon also. So if you guys want to contribute to our Patreon, check that out also. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Yeah. This has been a blast. Thanks, guys, so much. Thank you. All right, take it easy, guys. <laughs>